So we're on Psalm 6 today. We finished Psalms uh, for a little while. And uh, I've been surprised how much I've loved them. We're going to read Psalm 6. If you want to stretch your legs, now's the time to do so, uh, because you'll be sat down for the next hour. (laughs) Psalm 6. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I'm worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. Amen. Psalm 6. Have you ever listened to someone talking about how to cope with a particular problem? And, um, and you thought, oh yeah, you've had it easy, mate. It, it might be something about bringing up children. And you thought, <laughs> you've never encountered children like mine. It might be about personal fitness. And, uh, and you thought, well, couch to 5K is, uh, is fine for most people, but you don't have my limbs. Actually, I did hear on the radio last week uh, of a couple. He was 73 and she was 69 and they'd just done their first 5K. I thought, Egypt's. <laughs> um, I was impressed. I couldn't understand why. Um, but it might be in church and, uh, and Martin is exhorting you to trust in Christ, pleading with you to believe in him so you can stand in the congregation of the righteous. And you thought, if you only knew what I did as a young person, no one should be forgiven for that lifestyle. Well, just for once, I won't argue with you. If that's what you think. Nobody should be forgiven for that lifestyle. But you see, the truth is that with God, everybody can be forgiven. Everybody can be forgiven if they come to Jesus, everyone. And then for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking uh, at a particular way in which David approached prayer, how he thought carefully about his situation, how he ordered his thoughts before sharing them with God, how he went on to list the characteristics of God, those characteristics which fitted best with his present position, and how that cataloguing of the characteristics of God morphed into praise and then David is praising God as he uttered that fantastic prayer that we saw in Psalm 5 last week lead me Lord in your righteousness because of my enemies make your way straight before me and it might be that as you reflected on David's prayer in Psalm 5 you thought well that's fine that's that's great when When everything is reasonable and you've only got a few issues that are bothering you, but when the going really gets tough, how on earth will I remember how to structure a prayer like that? You say, Steve, if only you could sit where I'm sitting, you'd not be so quick to share prayer methodology with me. Well, let me give you three very quick responses if you've thought like that, or if at any point in the future you're tempted to think like that. First one, one liner, David was in dire straits. This is not an okay situation where he had plenty of time to think about things. 
David was in dire straits. And then the second thing is that David could write Psalm 5 because he was familiar with that way of praying. It was what he routinely did in the okay times. And so when the going got rough, it was like an automatic response. This is, well, this is how you pray. He was slipping, if you like, into spiritual autopilot. And we mention this way, you might not realise it, but we mention this way of behaving quite often here. It's usually about recognising and reminding yourself that God is love. And that God loves you in everything that he does for you. Um, we tell you that the time to remember that is when everything is... Can we use the phrase hunky-dory? Do we use that phrase any, these days? Is that a young person's phrase? Do you get that? Hannah's going, don't think so. Okay. When everything's going really, really great, that's the time to remind yourself that God does everything uh, for you. You get your understanding of God's ways of dealing with you sorted out in the good times. And then when the really tough times hit, you sort of slip into autopilot. You remind yourself of those things that you've been telling yourself for ages. So when everything is smashing you, you just remind yourself automatically everything works together for good. And that comes from the good times. So we're now considering one particular response to last week's Psalm 5. And that response says it's fine to teach structured prayer, but surely structured prayer is for the good times. And I'm saying to you, nope, it's for all time. But the time to learn it is in the good times, so that when the bad times hit, like David, you just slip into autopilot mode. But there is another answer to the response that structured prayer can be difficult. And that answer is, yes, absolutely, it can be hard. Sometimes life deals you such a blow that you almost can't think. You, you can scarcely pray. But the joy is that as you read your Bible, you discover that times like that are to be expected. But before they come, God shows you how to cope with them. And it's sort of... As I was thinking about it, there's something somewhere at the back of my mind that says, look, when you're a firefighter, you're not just taught one way of putting out a fire. You're taught a whole series of ways. You're taught how to do it, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming now, when there's somebody trapped inside the building, and you're taught how to do it when there's nobody and you're not actually worried about life. Different ways. And uh, as we go through the scriptures, we find a whole host of lessons of how to pray. But as we read Psalm 6, David is facing one of those times when you can't think. There is time to think, but his mind is filled with so much that logical thought is hard. I wonder if you recognise that feeling. We've all been there, haven't we? Our mind is just spinning. And friends say, well, just stop. And you go, no, I can't. Just calm down and just think, I can't. Well, let's get into Psalm 6. You'll see David's a bit like that. Let's see what we can learn from God's word. It starts off in verse 1. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline in me in your wrath. Rebuke, discipline. We're not... Totally sure when David wrote this, but he was clearly concerned that God was turning his back on him because he was rebuking him and he was disciplining him. Now, it's not difficult, is it, for us to appreciate that that could have been the case. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had to cover it up. He had Bathsheba's husband killed. He was subsequently unable or unwilling to do anything in his family when his eldest son uh, raped his sister. And he com 
almost completely ignored it when another brother decided to take things into his own hands and, uh, and murdered the rapist brother. So there's plenty of reason there to think, actually, yeah, David could say, God is judging me. God is disciplining me. God has left me and is punishing me for my sin. That, that, it could well have been that. And David calls out to God in despair. So right from the beginning, we see this is not a neatly structured, well-considered approach. David is in despair and he cries out to God. And you know, it's wonderful, isn't it, that uh, the sovereign God of the whole universe doesn't stand on ceremony. We've been watching a, a Netflix program that we got a bit hooked on about the White House. And nobody goes into the Oval Office unless they're shown in by somebody. Well, it's not strictly true, because if you're in the, in the top team that are his advisors, they seem to charge in and out all the time. But, but normal people, they get into the Oval Office when they are ushered in. Doesn't, and many times they come in and they say, Mr. President, we're so pleased to see you. We are so worried about something. Of course, he says all the right words uh, and so on. But you see, God's not like that. We don't have to be ushered in. God doesn't stand on ceremony. God doesn't insist on protocol when we hit those really tough times. David cries out. And what does he cry? Verse 2, have mercy on me, Lord, for I'm faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. David is in intense agony of body and soul. I'm faint. My bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. And another translator says, my soul is drowning in darkness. Now, if we saw that, we'd say, oh, this is depression. So it could be, couldn't it? David, everything is getting on top of him. Our version says, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. I, I don't think I am faint quite in the 21st century conjures up the right feelings. Um, other translations I looked at, New American Standard Bible says, I am pining away. Now, that doesn't work for me, it might work for you. I mean, that sounds to me about somebody who's lovesick. <laughs> and David's not lovesick here. Um, the Message Bible says, can't you see I'm black and blue? But you see, that doesn't capture the agony of soul, does it? David is just beside himself physically, mentally and spiritually because God is dealing with him. And in his despair, what pearls drop from his lips for us to use and to imitate? Have mercy, heal me. That's all. Have mercy, heal me. But you see, it's what he needs. And he simply shares his need with God. Sometimes we think it's really important to have fancy words when we pray. You know, understand what I'm saying here. We don't even have to get our theology right when we are at rock bottom and we're calling out to God. All we have to do is call out to him. Have mercy on me, heal me, show me your grace, rescue me, whatever it is. We simply cry out. That was all, that was all David did. I'm not saying that getting theology right is unnecessary, because as I'm going to show you in the moment, he did. What I'm saying is, is when you have to cry to God, just tell him how it is in your heart. But you see, David's been doing this for a while, it would appear. And somehow, and for some reason, God has not responded in the way that David wanted. Because in verse 3, we see him, him crying out, How long, Lord? How long are you going to keep me like this? Clearly, it's been going on for a while. Why are you not stepping in to do something? And actually, how long is a common theme in the Psalms, isn't it? You see, God's timetable is not our timetable. And you will see the psalmist in many of the psalms, how long, Lord? That's why we read from James chapter 1 earlier, because that tells us 
why, the why be, behind how long. Because uh, we read this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, listen to this, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You face trials of many kinds. Those trials are to test your faith, and as they do so, it produces perseverance. Perseverance, the work of persevering in the faith, is to ensure that you become mature and complete, not lacking anything. Why is it, why is it that God doesn't spring to our rescue the minute we ask him to help? It's because he's wanting to see you become a mature believer. And maturity doesn't arrive overnight. And in the Christian, maturity doesn't arrive without some form of suffering and problems. But if you truly trust Jesus, then be certain that everything God does is completely for your own good. Because God loves you. And David knows that, and so he reminds himself, and actually uses it to remind God. In verse 4, he says, Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me. Why? Because of your unfailing love. Now, the Hebrew word that is used here for unfailing love is hesed. And in different places, um, Hesed is translated differently, so that causes some people to translate this verse, save me because of your compassion. Others translate it, save me because of your covenant love, the love you've promised me. David is not just saying, God, you love me. He's not just saying, God, you love me. So, and I think you could wrap all of those together. And what David is, is crying out, he's saying, you've promised to be my God. You are my covenant-keeping God. You are my promise-keeping God. You've promised that. And that promise means that you will love me with unfailing, compassionate love. So please deliver me. So you see, David does get into accurate theology. I don't want anybody here, anybody to ever think, let alone say, but even think that theology or the study of God is just for the professionals, just for the elders, just for those who preach. You see, how can David appeal properly to the loving nature of God unless he really understands what God says about his loving nature. I'm sure we'll pick this up later, but, you know, last week we, we were talking about, in Psalm 5, David rehearsing the characteristics of God. And if he didn't really understand those characteristics of God, the impact on his problem at that time, how could he go through them? And... Um, the whole psalm stands or falls in Psalm 5 on the character of God. David knows that God cannot be untrue to his character, therefore he cries out to him. He knows that the character of God is love, unfailing, compassionate love. God cannot fail that. He cannot be untrue to that characteristic. So knowing that, that's what he appeals to. It's almost, almost like a little child who comes up to mum when they've been really misbehaving and said, oh, but you really love me, and give you one of those looks and tries to melt your heart. And very quickly you learn how to deal with that and stop them doing that because they're only trying to manipulate you. David is not manipulating God. David is saying, you are my God. We have a relationship. You are the God who loves me and who's promised me unfailing, compassionate love. Please give it to me. But he needs a grasp of theology to be able to do that. 
So please never think that uh, understanding doctrine in the Bible is boring or unimportant. It's absolutely vital. But again, here's the issue. It's vital when you're being hit and knocked around, and that's not the time to suddenly sit down and start learning doctrine. And then we go on to see um, verse 5. David says, Among the dead no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from his grave? You're probably ahead of me. You probably worked this out already. What David is asking is if I die, I'll have no further opportunities to praise you on earth. Uh, I don't know about you, but growing up I used to watch uh, Cowboys. Of course, they don't have cowboys on the telly anymore, do they? But one of the things that cowboys used to growl is dead men tell no tales. And that's exactly what David's saying here. De except he's saying dead men can't praise you. Now, let's be clear. David is arguing for God to rescue him. That's what he's calling out for. That's what he wants. But as he does so, he again demonstrates that he understands theology. He knows his primary purpose on this earth is to praise God and to give God the glory. That's what David knows. That's why David's there. We might be tempted to think that our primary role on earth is to be the best mum and dad there is. Or perhaps be the best Christian we can be. Uh, perhaps the best worker we can be, perhaps the best friend anyone will ever have. Be all of those things, aim for all of those things, but your primary challenge on this earth is to praise God. In his uh, little um, book about uh, Psalm 6, Dale Ralph Davis puts it like this. He says, what's wrong with death? And his answer is this, you won't be able to stand in church singing praises to God because to praise God is the whole reason for your existence. We could say, what's wrong with COVID, couldn't we? It stops us from standing and praising God. Pauline and I had a conversation at lunchtime. I said, how long is it going to be before someone rips their mask off and sings at the top of their voice? <laughs> And she said, oh, I don't think so, I don't think so. I said, well, I, I wanted to this morning. And of course, I was then told, well, no, no. But, but it's not right, is it, for us not to want to praise God? And actually, that's why we're here. Many of you know the uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism, a series of question and answers. The first one. You're going to tell me I'm quoting it wrong, but I'm not, because this is in modern English. What is man's primary purpose? Not chief end. What is man's primary purpose? And you know the answer. Man's primary purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that is precisely David's argument here. He's saying, Lord, if you let me die, I can't glorify you. And that's what I'm here for. But having said that, David is close to his wit's end, isn't he? He's been weeping all night. You can just feel his pain. Verse 6, I'm worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Now some would say, that God knows this. And of course, he does know it. So, so there's no reason to tell God something that he already knows. But it's possible that you could even be thinking, God has far more important things to do than to take time to listen to my problems. Well, if you're ever tempted to think like that, let me just ask you a question in response. How do we know what God is like? Answer, by looking at Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But what was the heart of Jesus like? Well, it was filled with compassion, wasn't it? He laboured 
not just all day, but into the night so often uh, to heal all who came to him because he had such compassion. Matthew 14 says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. There was the widow, wasn't there, in um, Luke chapter 7, as Jesus got to the gate of the, ci of the city or the town, the widow just happened to be coming out remember the story and it says when the Lord saw her his heart went out to her Jesus has so much love for you that he gave his life his anguish and pain were of far greater magnitude than David's or anything you or I will ever experience look at Jesus and you just know that the Father's heart is full of compassion for you. You just know it because you see it in Jesus. Do not ever think that he isn't listening or he's too busy to deal with you. Just tell him. That's what David did. David just told it like his heart, because his heart was breaking. So here's David. He's in the depths of despair. We could spiritual. He was genuinely concerned that God had left him because of his sin. If only he could turn the clock back, but he can't. Every night he's awake sobbing and he just longs to be restored to God so he can praise him. In his anguish, in his pain, he cries out to God. And suddenly God steps in. That's what we can expect from our prayers too. God will answer our prayer always. Sorry, I really ought to rephrase that a little bit. God will always answer the prayers of those who stand in the assembly of the righteous. That's the common theme that we've had week after week after week, isn't it, with these Psalms. God's precious people are those who've come to trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. That work makes it possible for you to approach God despite your previous rebellion. That death on the cross means you can avoid God's righteous judgment for your rejection of his authority. More than anything else in this whole series, you need to know that trusting Christ is the most important thing you will ever do in your entire life. Well, where were we though? We, I was saying God will answer our prayers too, wasn't I? Always. It's just God doesn't give us what we want all the time because he knows better than us. And we know that too, don't we? And in this psalm, God does answer David, but David's deliverance hasn't yet come. Look with me at verse 10. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. The answer that David is looking for is deliverance from his enemies. And that's in the future. They will be overwhelmed. They will turn back. But not yet. Not yet. David's struggles will continue for a time because all of this is in the future. But do you know how David's whole demeanour and prayer changes? Because in, in verse 8, suddenly, it, in, from crying out and being in desperate straits, it suddenly it changes and he addresses his enemies. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. Suddenly, as David cries out to God as he reminds God that he is a covenant-keeping, loving God. As David reminds God that dead men can't praise him, suddenly God blesses David with such a sense of his peace. Suddenly God blesses David with an assurance that he has heard and he will act. I mean, you can hear the, the joy and relief in David's Words when instead of crying out to God, he addresses his enemies. Let me quote Dale Ralph Davis again. He puts it like this. 
Prayer doesn't change things. That's made you sit up, hasn't it? Even Nate, his head came up. Prayer doesn't change things, but prayer lays hold of God who changes things. And who, in prayer, changes you. And sometimes, in the midst of it all, he gives you the assurance that your plea has been granted. We've been here before, haven't we? John 14, with David and his Stuart Ollie illustration a few weeks ago. God can sometimes put us in positions where all we can do is cry out to him. We really can't think more than heal me, save me, rescue me, keep me, that's that sort of thing. And sometimes that prayer of faith, that is what this is, isn't it? It is a prayer of faith. We need to remember that and recognise that because David was in, in intense suffering. He could have looked anywhere for relief. Could have looked anywhere, but he didn't. This is a genuine prayer of faith. God, David knows that only God can help. Even though God may have turned his back on him, David knows his only hope is in asking God to have mercy on him. There is nowhere else to look. And sometimes this prayer of faith is rewarded in an unusual way. God steps in and gives you an overwhelming sense of his rescue, even though it hasn't happened. Now David can sleep without tears. Now David's pain-racked body can slowly recover. Some people think that actually these first five or six psalms were written about the same time. And uh, where was it? It was, verse, it was in Psalm 3, wasn't it? We read um, how many weeks ago now. Psalm 3, verse 5, I lay down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. It's a bit of difference between David there and David at the beginning of this psalm. Beginning of this psalm, he's sobbing all night. But now he can sleep without tears. Now David's pain-racked body can slowly recover. Not because his problems have gone. They, they haven't. They will go. They haven't gone yet. But because he knows that God has rescued him, even though it hasn't happened yet. My friend, do you trust Jesus? Then recognise your life restarts when you trust him. And that can mean that your troubles intensify. Uh, a pal of mine says you only get flack when you're over the enemy target. If you don't know what that means, I'll tell you afterwards. But what a friend we have in Jesus. He is sat at God's right hand, speaking on our, heart, on our behalf when we pray. The Holy Spirit, too, is on, is on our side, taking our groanings, just the things we groan about. Can, can you imagine David in, in this scenario? He, he, he has words, but I reckon there were more groans than anything. The Holy Spirit takes our groans to the throne room of God. And wherever we look in the Bible, wherever we look, we find teaching that God always answers the prayers of those who trust Jesus. And we find example after example after example of how to pray. My friend, this is your guidebook to prayer. Be sure you make the most of it. Let's pray together and then we can, uh, we can enjoy some worship music. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the confidence that it gives us to cry out to you, even when we're at rock bottom. Lord, thank you that these examples of the psalmist just help us, while we're in the good times now, to work out how we behave in the bad times. And to carry through some of those principles. So, Father, we should always be ready to cry out to you, shouldn't we? We should always be ready to pour out our hearts to you. We should always be ready to do so with repentance. And, Father, thank you that that prayer, when we pray to you, can be 
a real prayer of faith because we know that you will answer it. We don't know how you will answer it, that's the only difference, but we know you will. We can be absolutely certain when we're sliding down that slippery slope, when we're close to uh, rock bottom, we can know for sure that you will deal with us and you will hear our prayer and you will answer it. What a great, what a great confidence booster for the Christian. Father, would you let your Holy Spirit take your words and apply them to our hearts. So often when men preach your word, they, they belittle it. We don't mean to, but we just do. But Father, your Holy Spirit never does that. Your Holy Spirit never gets it wrong. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will apply your word now to our hearts. We thank you for this opportunity to be together Father, would you dismiss us as we go to our homes? Would you bless us during this coming week? We pray again for our children as they're going back to school, that they'll have a great week. You'll keep the teachers. Particularly, we pray that you'll keep our children and our teachers safe and fit and well and able to be at school all week. Lord, would you help us as we walk through this world it's not a christian place it's 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 very anti-god but we pray lord you'll help us to be the ambassadors that you've called us to be and lord would you by your word teach us to pray make us more prayerful and help us to pray the prayers of faith and wait for you to give us your answers. Lord, we pray you'll bless us now and send us home safely in Jesus' name. Amen.